Hello, this is Pastor Scott Conway at QX Church. Find us online at qxchurch.org. Today we're talking about being caught up in moments. Being caught up in moments. And specifically we're talking about being caught up sometimes in negative moments. Experience is a great teacher. They say that you never learn anything better than when you learn it from experience. I've even heard teachers say, experience isn't just the best teacher. Experience is the only teacher. Now, if you're smart, you will learn from your experience. Some people just have experiences. John Maxwell is fond of saying that sometimes wisdom doesn't come with age. Sometimes age just comes by itself. <clears throat> Some of those people don't have 25 years of experience. They have one year of experience 25 times because they never learn anything. So experience is a great teacher if you actually learn from experience, if you reflect on the experience, if you try to grasp the principles, the collection of principles that we call a philosophy, you try to understand how things work from your experience. You never learn anything as well as when you experience it yourself, but if you're smart, you will also learn from the experience of others, the experience passed on to you, the things other people teach you that they actually know from experience. Even though experience is such a great teacher, we still get caught up in moments. There are still times where no matter what we know, in a moment of anger, we behave in a way as though what we know is true isn't true. In a moment of fear, we behave as though what we know is true isn't true. In a moment of worry, in a moment of pain, in a moment of disappointment, of frustration, of confusion. We sometimes behave as though that which we know is true is not actually true. Even though we really do know better. And even though if we paused, if we thought about it, if we could step outside of those feelings that we're having in the moment, if we could choose carefully that which we do, we might do something very, very different. Thus it is, and thus it has always been. Let's go back to the beginning. <coughs> Pardon me. Back to the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was good. And then it was good again, and more good, and more good. And then the day that God created man, he says, it is very good. So things are pretty good right at the beginning. Adam and Eve are in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Because free will is such an important thing to God, he has to give them a choice. He has to give them a way to either be obedient to righteousness and goodness, or to not. Not simply to choose between good answers and other good answers. Filled throughout the garden are nothing but good answers. One tree, one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it's almost like God gives them a multiple choice test. He says, all right, this is a multiple choice test. You have 26 possible answers. The question is, what is 2 plus 2? A, is it 4? B, is it four? C, is it four? And so on down the line. So it gets down to Z. And Z is snake. And he tells him, the answer is not snake. Do not choose snake. You've got all the other answers around. You've got 25 right answers you can choose from. And I'm telling you which one's the right answer. I'm telling you which one's the wrong answer. So that way you won't pick the wrong answer just because you made a mistake. That you'll have to do that on purpose. So right answers all around them. They're in the Garden of Eden. You don't get a better deal than that. As far as we know, they are immortal. They could have been immortal shining beings. They could have existed in more than three dimensions, even more than four dimensions. That the dimension of space and time might not have meant the same thing to them that it means to us. Their ability to get things done, it could have been different. We really don't know. I mean, there's been some speculation. 
But trying to imagine what life would be like in an entropy-free environment, trying to imagine what life would be like in a garden like that, planted by God's hand. I mean, we really can't even wrap our head around it. We try to imagine it with the best of the best and the most beautiful and the most gorgeous gardens we can possibly imagine, with the most amazing fruits, the most amazing vegetables we can possibly imagine. Into this garden, God has put man. Now think about this for a moment. Adam has a brain personally designed, engineered, and created by God himself. Probably a pretty smart guy. Eve has a brain designed and engineered and hand-created by God. Probably a pretty smart woman. And so probably the most intelligent man and the most intelligent woman as far as the perfect functioning of the human brain are put in this fabulous garden. And they're given just one rule. They have a chance to hang out with God, to chat with God. God even delegates things to them. Like, Adam, hey, why don't you name the animals? And Adam doesn't have to come to God and say, well, God, what is your will for the name of this animal? God would just say, I have no will for the animal. I'm bringing the animals to you to see what you want to call them. It's up to you. You get to name them. And it was great. Intimate relationship with God. Intimate relationship with one another. Man and woman actually literally created to be together. And so what happens? We have the experience. The garden. The garden of Eden. A relationship with God that God can show up and manifest and actually hang out with them. That we teach that heaven is an eternal relationship with God. Heaven is you get to live in God's house. You get to live in his home, in his personal territory, on his estate, so to speak. Where his presence fills the estate in a tangible, powerful, real way. Adam and Eve had this kind of relationship with God. What do they do? Well, in Scripture, as far as we can tell, God seems to have told Adam, do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. That's your one wrong answer. In your multiple choice question of what do you eat in the garden, every answer in the garden is a right answer except for that one. And I'm telling you in advance, that's the wrong answer. I'm putting the wrong answer in the middle of the garden so that you have a choice. You can walk in obedience or you can walk in disobedience. But you have one rule and one rule only. Do not eat of that fruit. For in the day that you eat of that fruit, death comes. Which many of us interpret to mean that entropy begins. Now death becomes a real thing where it wasn't before pretty serious consequences. Now, Adam may not have a great understanding of what this death thing is, but he has a brain personally crafted by God. Pretty smart person. He could probably figure out a whole bunch of stuff. Then Eve is created. Now, the serpent is put there to try to tell them, guess the wrong answer, guess the wrong answer, do the wrong answer. Do you want to do the wrong? You don't want to do all those right answers. The right answers are boring. Do the wrong answer. And they know it's the wrong answer. A lot of times Eve is portrayed as kind of this sweet, naive little girl that doesn't really know any better. She had a brain personally crafted by God. The serpent asks her what the rule is. She answers, the rule is, don't eat and don't touch. Now, wait a minute. The rule wasn't don't touch. Now, if she really believed that smartest woman probably that ever lived, she probably could have remembered one rule. It's possible that Adam told her, don't touch. It's possible that the smartest man with the smartest brain ever created calculated in his man brain well, if you're not supposed to eat, if you don't touch, you won't be eating. 
And so what happens then? The serpent convinces Eve. Now, one of the hypotheses, and this actually matches with a long-standing uh, rabbinical teaching, is that the serpent drew Eve, or pushed Eve, or pulled Eve against the tree. Or the serpent himself touched the tree. And if the serpent touched the tree, you can imagine the serpent going, so you can't eat or touch of this tree or you die. Something really, really bad happens. Well, that's an interesting rule. Well, let's find out. And to reach out and touch the tree, you know, huh, look at that. Nothing happened. Here, Eve, come here. And you can just imagine, if it, no, 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 I'm, I'm not supposed to, I, I don't know why nothing bad's happening to you, but I know I'm not supposed to touch it. And based upon one of the rabbinical <coughs> teachings, that the servant shoved Eve up against the tree so that Eve made physical contact with that tree. He said, look at that. You were told that God said, if you touch that tree, you will die. And look at that. You touched the tree. And you didn't die. Maybe God's lying to you. Maybe there's something there God doesn't want you to have. Convinces Eve to eat the fruit. Now, when Eve ate the fruit, it says it, she gave to her husband there with her. Now, one of the implications there is that Adam was around. He was watching this unfold. So he ate. Whole story there. Now we don't know if it was Eve's sin alone that was enough. Because she probably heard it from Adam. So she was actually disobedient to Adam. Perhaps not disobedient to God. Adam, however, we know, heard it directly from God. So when Adam ate that fruit, Adam knew. God himself said, and I am walking in direct disobedience to what God told me face to face, eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose, in one of our personal meetings, God said, and I am walking in direct disobedience to what I know God said. Eve may or may not have been. Eve, the Bible tells us, was deceived. She was being disobedient to what she was told. But what we don't know is whether she was told by God and whether she was told by Adam. It appears as though she was probably told by Adam, and that Adam kind of embellished on the rule. A little sliver of legalism claiming that the rule that Adam made up was actually God's rule, not even taking responsibility for his own rule. And this is one of our basic church rules on legalism, is we don't mind if someone makes legalistic rules. We don't mind if God's line is out here and you draw the line way back here. We don't mind if God says, here's the cliff and you'll fall off the cliff, and we're going to put the fence all the way back here for the sake of safety. We don't mind if a church does that. So long as the church is open and honest about the fact that, well, God's line is over there, we are putting the line over here for the sake of safety. So when the Bible says, be not drunk on wine, that means, okay, the cliff is over there. Don't get drunk. And even then, there might be some exceptions. Says, but we're not just going to put the line on, well, don't get, you know, to have more than a glass of wine. We're going to put that way back here, no alcohol at all. But this is our church rule. This isn't God's rule. If you're going to be a fundamentalist, that's the rule. Not a Bible rule, a church rule, a denominational rule. I think that's perfectly okay. And there is a place for that. And it could be that that's what Adam was doing, except he didn't take responsibility for his own rule. He ascribed it to 
God, just like if this church says, God's line is here. If you even so much as take communion with real wine, that's a vote for Satan. That's a vote for drunk driving. That's a vote to kill every person who's ever been killed by a drunk driver. And I've heard pastors preach that way. Evidently, that's part of what Adam did. The experience was the Garden of Eden. The moment was the temptation and the fall. When he knew better, he knew better, and he did it anyway. Well, fortunately, Adam and Eve are the only people to ever have an experience that goes one way and a temptation to have a moment going another. Well, <laughs> we wish that was true. Israel is in Egypt. They've been enslaved. They've lived there for over 400 years. And somewhere along the line, the line of pharaohs that honored and respected Joseph was in some way replaced. Whether they were replaced by war, by takeover, intermarriage, whatever it is, ultimately isn't as important as the fact that the new pharaoh, at some point, decided these Hebrews are a problem. And they were enslaved, perhaps all at once, perhaps systematically, I don't know. But it got to be so bad that the pharaoh ordered all of the boys to be killed. And Moses got hidden. And then when they thought they couldn't hide him anymore, they put him in a, a little boat of reeds and they sent him off the river and he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised as a prince of Egypt. Realized somewhere along the line that he was a Hebrew. Came to the defense of the Hebrews by killing an Egyptian. Ended up fleeing for his life at the age of 40. Spent 40 years in the desert living the life of a nomadic shepherd. And at the age of 80, he gets sent back to the whole burning bush experience. Walks in. Goes before Pharaoh, probably the son of the Pharaoh that was as his uncle or his father, grandfather. Probably this man was his brother. And now the big question that Pharaoh has to face is whether or not he's going to let Moses' people go. So we have the plagues. The plagues begin. One plague after another, accumulating ultimately in the death of the firstborn. For every family that does not have the Passover sacrifice blood on their doorposts. Ten plagues, miraculous plagues. Some things are somewhat duplicated by the priests, the magicians, by whatever means they did it. Some people think they had actual supernatural power. Some people thought that they were like Siegfried and Roy or David Copperfield or Lance Burton, that they were just skilled illusionists. But regardless of what it was, there's been some pretty serious stuff going on. Water turning into blood, frogs, gnats, boils. Things that can't be duplicated by the magicians. Darkness. And death. It's pretty serious. And they get let go and they head off and they end up with their backs to the water. And then what do they see? They see fire come down from heaven. Put a wall of flame between them and the Egyptian army. And then Moses turns to the water and the Red Sea parts for them, and they walk through on dry land. When the Egyptian army is released from behind the wall of fire, they decide to pursue. Now, just as a matter of military strategy, by the way, if the god of the other side is holding the waters open, <laughs> that god holding the waters open might not be too keen on you showing up and trying to kill his people. Just saying. Then it occurred to the Egyptians at the time, so they go charging through, and once the Israelites get to the other side, God just lets the water go. 
Egyptian army has been summarily defeated by their own folly of walking through a door being held open only for the Israelites. Pretty powerful stuff. Try to imagine being there. I mean, the Israelites grumbled at first because Moses shows us, says, let my people go, that you have the snakes uh, coming out of the staffs, and, and the work gets doubled, and they get their hands double taken away, and they have to fend for themselves. Okay, you can see the grumbling about this. That would make perfect sense. But somewhere along the line of the ten plagues, you got to imagine... But you might kind of stop and think, whoa, okay, there's really something going on here. And then when you actually get let go, you got to figure, hey, that's pretty awesome. And then when the army comes after you and go, whoa, hey, wait a minute, now this is a whole different deal. And they get blocked by the flame, the ocean parts for you, and you walk through. Wouldn't you like to believe that you would be standing in awe of God and that that memory would stay with you forever and you would stand in faith and faithfulness to the Almighty from that day forward? I would like to think I would. But what did Israel do? They grumbled. As early as Mount Sinai, they get through the Red Sea, they get to Mount Sinai, Moses is gone for a month, and a bunch of the people, some substantial chunk of the people are going, Aaron, Moses is gone. We need a God to worship. And if you were to believe the story that Aaron told Moses, they gave him all this gold, they threw it in the fire, and out popped this calf. But Aaron fashions a calf for them. The man who is appointed as the spokesman for God Almighty fashions a golden calf and some percentage of these Israelites that saw all ten plagues are dancing and worshipping in front of this golden calf having what very well might have been an orgy. Now, sometimes in our distance and our judgment we like to look at that and go back. Like, ah, that's so stupid. I would never do anything like that. And not everyone did. Moses came down and he was a little miffed. Smashed the tablets God gave him. Called on someone to come to rallying to his side and the, the Levites did that. And killed those people. Obviously this is back in the day where pretty much life was cheap. Pretty serious and like, weren't you there? But then was that it? Or did they go wandering around and they got manna from heaven? Free food delivered to them six days a week. And on day number six, they got double, so there was one day off. And they grumbled because they didn't have meat. They grumble when they didn't have water. And then when they supernaturally get water, later on they grumble because they don't get water again. Moses gets so fed up that he smashes the rock with his staff and gets in trouble with God because he was in direct disobedience to what God himself from his own lips told Moses to do. And Moses knew what God told him to do and he was so miffed that he directly disobeyed God's direct instruction directly to him that Moses knew was exactly what God was telling him to do. This isn't that he heard from some preacher interpreting scripture that God's written word has said. No, this is God himself told Moses face to face, eyeball to eyeball. God told Moses and Moses directly disobeyed because he was so miffed at the people. Cost Moses the right to go into the promised land because he allowed his anger to overcome his obedience. God told him exactly. He says, speak to the rock. 
and Moses bashes the rock. And there was a, supposed to be a powerful metaphor there. And Moses blows the metaphor. When he was told by God what to do. Not just he believed it, not just he interpreted scripture that way, not that he heard the passage of God told him and Moses blew it. Moses had that face-to-face -face experience with God and in a moment of anger, he lost the promised land. Israel gets all the way to the promised land. They send in their spies. Joshua and Caleb come back and say, this is amazing land. So they remember the ten plagues. They remember the fire. They remember the parting of the Red Sea. They look at this great land with these mighty people and think, wow, God's giving us some great land. The other ten spies. Oh my gosh, the people. The people, they're great warriors, they're strong, they're powerful, they're mighty, they're giants. They're going to destroy us, we'll be as grasshoppers in their sight. Were you not there? Do you not remember the ten plagues, the fire, the sea? Do you not pay attention to the manna from heaven? Are you not looking at this pillar of smoke by day, fire by night, hello? Seems to have not occurred to them. God says, all right, 40 years. 40 more years in the wilderness. And then all of a sudden, people, whoa, 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 okay, okay, we'll go. We don't want 40 years in the wilderness. And God had already said no. Now they're being disobedient to God. God said, go. They said, no, we're not going. God said, all right, don't go. They said, no, no, no. But now, but now that God says, don't go, now we want to go. Forty years in the wilderness, it cost them. And was the grumbling over? No, the grumbling was not over. They would grumble again and again. With God's presence right there. The pillar right there. They would grumble. The manna coming down from heaven six days a week. They would grumble. Paying a price in serpent bites. Paying a price with sickness on the quail. They would grumble again and again and again. We might like to think that we want to do that. They were human. And you know what? We're human too. And how often do we get lost in moments? Even though we had the experience. Even though the evidence is right there in front of us. In that moment of anger, in that moment of fear, in that moment of hurt, of disappointment, of confusion, of frustration. We forget. We forget. Well, that was Adam and Eve. <clears throat> in the beginning, they didn't know better. And that was the, the Israelites as a community. There's always going to be some percentage. You know, 20 percent of the people are going to be against you 100 percent of the time. But you know, I'm a man of God. I'm a man after God's own heart. I would never do anything like that. Maybe, maybe not. King David, a man after God's own heart. King David of David and Goliath fame. You don't even have to be a believer. You don't even have to believe in the Bible. The idea of David and Goliath is so entrenched in our culture that we use it as an ordinary idiom. When you talk about David and Goliath, the little guy against the big guy. David slew Goliath. David becomes king. David was the faithful one. David brought the ark and David wanted to build a temple for God. David was a great warrior. David was the giant slayer who had his giant slayers that served him. He was the undefeatable king, the warrior. He had listed in the Bible seven, maybe even eight wives. We don't know for sure that was actually the limitation. There's some various interpretations that they were allowed up to 18 and the only wives that were listed were the ones that were a political consequence. Later on though, we know that Solomon, he, he just went hog wild on the wives and concubines. 
We also have no idea how many concubines David had. The point ultimately being that when he's up there, if he's looking around over the people and he gazes down there and he sees some hot babe, and all it is is a vision to him, he may not have any idea who she is as a human being, and it's kind of a stirring of that sexual energy in him. He's got plenty of women that by the law and culture are available to him. He can kind of get a little stirred up and go and have sex with any of at least seven, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds of women without consequence. But no, he looks over there like, hey, hey, that's Bathsheba. I know her. Because how would he know her? Well, because Uriah is one of his top warriors. Bathsheba's dad is another one of his top warriors. Bathsheba's grandfather is one of his advisors, so you can't tell me he doesn't know who this woman is. So at least there's that in that she's not just nothing but a body to him. But think about what this means in the culture of the day. Adultery was one of the most serious offenses you could commit having a sexual relationship with a woman who was married to another man. Now, if you live in a culture that treasures genealogy the way the Israelites treasured their genealogy, when a woman is pregnant, you have to know who the father is because the genealogy drives so much in this culture. And when the genealogy is what drives the culture, and the genealogy is what tells you what you get to own, where you get to live, what power you have, what rights you have, what part of the country is yours to live in. All of these things are dependent on genealogy. It is critical in that culture that when a baby is born, you know his lineage. And in a culture like that, the sexual fidelity of married women becomes critical so that you know who the baby belongs to. Now, sometimes some people in the 21st century look back and think, well, you know, that's kind of archaic. And Well, think about this. What was there, the birth control pill back in David's day? What was the state of condoms? I, I don't know. As far as I can guess, there may not have been any. I mean, how many birth control options really honestly existed back all these thousands of years ago? Where sexual infidelity very often would lead to pregnancy. I mean, think about the sexual activity of our young people, the sexual activity of anybody for that matter, if there was no birth control. How much more critical would it be to keep that locked down? I mean, look at our abortion rates. And we have the birth control pill. We have condoms. We have implants. We have tons of options. And in certain segments of our community, we actually have more babies being aborted than being born. Even with all of this. How much more if we had no birth control methods? Can you imagine? So this is a very serious offense. And what does he do? The man after God's own heart. The man held up, not only in his lifetime, but despite blowing this, that, that, he is still heralded as the obedient one to God. He's standing up there checking out Bathsheba. Has all of these women that are his to have, and he's checking out one of his top warrior's wives, one of his top warrior's daughters, one of his top advisor's granddaughters, and decides to send a servant out to go get her anyway. And the man after God's own heart, in a culture that treasures genealogy, in a situation where he's got all of these women that are his to have, has to have her. Another man's wife, in an era with no birth control, Guess what happens? 
she gets pregnant. Hmm. You're having sex with a woman in an area with no birth control. I'm not shocked. I don't think King David would have been shocked he had kids already. Probably had a pretty good idea how these things worked, and he did it anyway. Now, we don't know what level of complicity Bathsheba had in the equation, because it is a summons from the king. She might not have had a legal choice. But David certainly did. Man after God's own heart. Many wives and concubines checks out the wife of one of his top people, who is also the daughter of one of his top people, who is also the granddaughter of one of his top people, in an age and a culture where adultery is a sin punishable by death, in a culture where the genealogy being known is so critical to the entire culture, and he does it anyway. Then what does he do? Like, oh boy, okay, gotta cover this up. Gotta get you right here, have sex with Bathsheba, send him back to the front lines, baby will be born while he's still gone, and then he'll come home to a kid. Okay, I can fix this. Now in a culture that values and treasures genealogy, part of what of course you're gonna have is that's not Uriah's actual genealogy. David, of course, knows this. Bathsheba knows this. But they're trying to cover themselves legally in front of society. But then Uriah won't do it. His men are in the field. He's not going to go home and hang out with his wife when no one else gets his opportunity. He is here to deliver a military message. He still considers himself on duty. He won't go. So David hatches another plot to try to conceal this whole thing and sends Uriah with a sealed message to his general to send the front lines up to the wall where they are in danger from the warriors up on the wall and then pull back from the front line to try to make sure Uriah gets killed. Uriah dying is the key point here. Puts the entire front line at risk possibly getting dozens of people killed, Uriah among them, brings Bathsheba into his household on whatever pretext or pretenses he did that. The baby is born, and the baby dies. Because there's a problem here. If the baby lives, can the baby be the son of David if the baby was conceived while Bathsheba was married to Uriah? Legally, the baby would be considered Uriah's. And in a culture where so much is driven by genealogy, that's going to put that baby in an impossible position. And so God doesn't leave the baby in the impossible position. God takes the baby. David does the wailing and the gnashing of teeth in the morning for the baby, hoping God will deliver the baby. That there will be some solution, some answer to this. And personally, I don't see the answer. It wasn't my baby. I could totally see David's side. But God knows what this is going to do. And that that baby is going to continue to suffer. And that whole lineage could continue to suffer. Because of what David did. It's not like David, some peasant out in the fields nobody's ever heard of. And the baby dies. Bathsheba becomes one of the wives and becomes the mother of Solomon. Bathsheba could have been wife number seven, probably wife number eight, and became the mother of the next king. David, a man after God's own heart. Adultery and murder to cover it up. And while adultery might not be nearly a serious defense, and a lot of people don't like it, of course, but we don't put people to death over it, that we don't condone it, 
and say that it's a good thing and everybody needs to have an affair. Well, you haven't had one yet, you need to do We don't do that. But we don't see it as a capital offense where the punishment is equal to that of murder because someone is jeopardizing a genealogy, a driving force in the culture, especially in this country, we're a very individualistic country. Now it's more of a personal moral choice thing. We don't see it as a high-end criminal thing. And a lot of that is probably driven because we have birth control today. Back then you didn't. The genealogy isn't as critical today. Back then it was. And David was known as a man after God's own heart. And he violated one of the highest taboos he could drag a woman into. Alright, well those are Old Testament. We're more mature than that now. You don't see stuff like that in the New Testament. Well, here's a really fast turnaround. Peter! Jesus is asking, Who do they say I am? Who do you think I am? And somewhere in this mix, Peter stands up and says, You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus tells him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but God who is in heaven. I mean, think about this for a moment. Peter just got told by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ, whom Peter acknowledges the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Who in that theological standpoint means that you are God in the flesh. I know who you are. And Jesus telling him, Peter, you've got this special thing going on with God because there's no way for you to see this and figure this out with your eyes. God himself has revealed this truth to you. And Peter going, hey, I've got, I've got, check that out. You hear what Jesus said? Blessed am I. You know, flesh and blood? No, no. i got this whole God thing going on here. Well, you find the very next thing that happens. They're getting ready to go to Jerusalem. Peter stands up, no, no, no. Jesus, heaven forbid, you're not going to go to Jerusalem, it's way too dangerous. To which the very next thing recorded that Jesus says to Peter is, Get thee behind me, Satan, for your eyes are not on the things of God. Now imagine this kind of whiplash for Peter. Wait, 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 wait. Had this thing going on. What do you mean, get thee behind you? Satan, Satan, adversary, what are you talking about? Oh my gosh. What, what, I, I, I like that blessed are you, Simon Barchard, and things. Just, I, 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 Satan, really? Pretty quick turnaround. Pretty quick turnaround. As far as scripture records it, it could have even been two back to back conversations. And that's how fast we can lose it. The disciples, the disciples hanging out with Jesus for three and a half years, seeing the miracle, seeing the walking on water, seeing the feeding of the thousands, seeing the raising of the dead. It's a pretty serious stuff. The dead are raised, the blind see. The crippled are healed. I mean, they watch these things happen. And they get the backstage pass. They get the debriefs. They get all of these lessons unpacked for them. And they get to be there firsthand for three and a half years. They know what the deal is. <coughs> and then what happens? One of these men that spent three and a half years watching these miracles play out. Three and a half years under the direct teaching and toolage of Jesus Christ himself betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. <coughs> we don't like to think that we know better, right? Shows up with the Roman cohort, betrays Jesus with the kiss. Well, that was just one of the twelve. I mean, the other eleven. The other eleven, they, they stood by him, right? No. They fled. They ran. They hid. All of them except John. One of them betrays him. One of them stands by his side. And the other ten scatter and hide. 
Peter kind of follows from a distance, trying to keep an eye on what's going on. After all, he is. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Someone says, hey, aren't you a Galilean? Don't, don't, you, you know him, right? No, 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 I don't know him. Denies Jesus. Denies Jesus again. Denies Jesus the third time that car crows Jesus looks at him. And Peter realizes that even though just hours before he had told Jesus, even if all of the other disciples betray you, I will never deny you. I will never deny you. I will be by your side even unto death. And he couldn't stand by Jesus' side at the questioning of a girl and a fire. Miracles upon miracles, teaching, mentoring, coaching, training, the backstage pass, the intimate relationship. And despite seeing all of that, one of them betrays him. Most of them scatter. And one of his top three guys denies him. Hours after swearing he would go to death with him before he would deny him. So what's the lesson in here? Well, the lesson is thus it has always been. Very often we live our lives completely ignoring truths that we know. Very often we make choices and decisions in moments of negative emotion. In direct conflict with that which we know to be true. Adam did it. Moses did it, both of them under almost identical circumstances, where God told them directly, face to face, exactly what they had to do. They heard it straight from God himself, and they were directly disobedient. The Israelites, seeing the ten plagues and grumbling at every turn, it seems. The man after God's own heart violating one of the biggest taboos in his culture. Betraying Bathsheba herself, for one, but based upon the rules of the culture and the value and the power of the genealogy, he is betraying his faithful servant, his other faithful servant, and his other faithful servant. Because remember, if, if the husband, the father, and the grandfather are all working directly for David, that means he's got three people there that when she's pregnant, and this is supposed to be Uriah's son, they're all looking at the genealogy, they're all looking at the, the blood lineage that is so crucial, so central to the culture, and he's going to think it's his great-granddaughter or great-grandson, He's going to think it's his great-granddaughter or great-grandson, and he's going to think it's his son or daughter. And in a culture driven by genealogy, imagine how huge that is. I mean, this isn't just a night of passion. This is the disruption of a genealogical line in a culture where the genealogical line is the cornerstone of cultural organization. That's why it was a capital offense, is it's the cornerstone of how the whole culture is organized. And you have to know. So temper your emotions, those emotions felt in moments. You need to temper those with the truth that we know. So when we know a truth, we need to find a way to keep that truth in front of us even when we're angry, to keep that truth in front of us, even when we're hurting, even when we're scared, even when we're worried, to keep that truth in front of us, even when we're hurt, even when we're reeling from pain, to cling to the truth that we know. And if scripture is any indication, none of us are going to do it perfectly. If our own life experience is any indication, at least I can tell you I won't always do it perfectly. Maybe you can. I can't. 
We know what's true. We have personal experiences, observation, trusted lessons that tell us what is true. And then in a moment of negative emotion, in a moment of anger or even fury, in a moment of hurt or woundedness, in a moment of disappointment, frustration, confusion, fear, terror, need, loneliness, pain, we behave as though that which we know is not true. In that moment of negative emotion, it all becomes momentarily eclipsed by how we feel in that moment. Now sometimes these lapses have little consequences much past those moments. Like Peter. When Peter was, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And then he's, get thee behind me, Satan. There's no indication there was any lasting consequences beyond that statement. When Peter denied Jesus three times, when Jesus returns, he affirms, Peter, do you love me? Tend my lambs, tend my sheep, shepherd my flock. Gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. Peter didn't suffer any lasting consequences from his get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't suffer any lasting consequences from denying Jesus three times. On the other hand, sometimes these lapses do permanent harm. Adam and Eve destroyed a world. Adam and Eve introduced something into the genetic lineage of all mankind on what might have taken minutes. In the split second of that bite, Adam sealed the fate of mankind and created the circumstances that would necessitate God's death to redeem what Adam was destroying. Pretty serious consequences. Sometimes it's in between. Israel for all their grumbling and disobedience and refusing to go into the promised land and all that, it cost them 40 years. 40 years it cost them. Not a permanent consequence, but a consequence. For David, it created huge disruption in his house. Did it destroy him, but boy, did it make a mess of things. So consider this for a moment. God can take our moments. And yet there are still lasting consequences for those moments. Human beings have a much lower tolerance than God. I don't know if you've noticed this. You might have the tolerance of God. Or sometimes what we call the patience of Job. I don't. So if in a moment of negative emotion someone were to forget all of the truth in the, my relationship with them, all of my history with them, all of my faithfulness to them, and in that moment do something sufficiently egregious, it could do permanent damage to that relationship. Some of these things did permanent damage. There are some things you can never take back. Adam couldn't go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, can you undo the fall? David couldn't go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, can you undo the pregnancy? Not abort the baby, undo the pregnancy. Peter can't go to Jesus and says, can you rewind history a little bit and, and, and like, can, can we skip the get thee behind me Say, can you give me another shot at that denial thing? I'm, I, I would be better off if I just ran away. So I'm not here denying you. God's not going to take that away. It's still there, and it will always be there. Where was your heart? Where was your motivation? Where were, were your eyes? What were you looking at, paying attention to? What for you in that time was so big and so important that you would ignore the truth? It's huge. And we all do it. Some of us do it in small ways. Some of us do it in not quite so small ways. Some of us do it in big ways. Some of us make huge life-changing decisions based on emotions triggered by moments. Some people have uprooted their entire families and moved them across the country 
or even to another country because of moments. Some people have made massively evil decisions in moments. In moments of negative emotion that sometimes eclipses the truth that we know. Sometimes you say things you can't take back. Sometimes you do things you can't take back. And it's always and forever there in our history. Israel couldn't take it back and go rushing in the promised land. Because now the rushing in the promised land is disobedience. Nope, they already made their choice. They already did their thing. They were already sentenced to 40 years. It's too late. It's too late. You already did it. You can't take it back. It's there. Now you have to live with it. The consequences. Sometimes the consequences are logical cause and effects, like Bathsheba's first pregnancy. Sometimes the consequences are punishment, a sentence, like Israel in 40 years. Sometimes the consequences are based on some large, huge, cosmic <coughs> law, like the fall. And sometimes, the consequences can be minimal, like Peter, and the get thee behind me, and the denying Jesus three times. And sometimes we don't know how that's going to end. So we need to do our best to have as few of these moments as we can. To allow our actual experience to govern our lives, to allow that which we know is true, to govern our lives. And as best as we can to understand sometimes where these negative emotions are coming from and try to keep in truth or keep in mind the truth that we know. <clears throat> 